I never get tired of hearing our men's quartet sing, and the songs are so meaningful as well. Take your Bibles, if you will, and open to the book of Matthew, chapter number 22. Matthew, chapter number 22. Matthew 22, and I want to begin reading in verse number 34. Matthew 22, and beginning in verse number 34, and we'll read down through. I I think we had a little bit of trouble with the microphone this morning. Everybody okay tonight? Amen? Can you hear me? Okay, this side can't hear. This side can. All right. Uh, Beginning in verse number 34. And we'll just read a few verses here down through verse number 38. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. To love the Lord with all your heart is the first and great commandment. As I thought about this passage, I got down, found several messages in print on the subject and on the passage and and read them, read several uh, commentaries about uh, the passage to see what they might have to say after I had read it a few times and meditated on it. And, uh, and it's amazing how, how um, there's, there's very little consensus on such a basic thing. But, but the real um, uh, conversation in all of those was, was that God is commanding someone to love, and how do you command someone to love? And so they go back and forth saying, well, it's not really a command. But yet Jesus answers the question, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus' answer is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And so therefore it is a commandment and any attempt to make it other than violates the scriptures. And the more I thought about it, the, the, the thing that was impressed upon me is that very often we think in terms of, you know, 2021, North America, you know, our culture. And, uh, and the way that we basically live is when that, that love is an emotion more than it is anything else. And we've got to feel that before we do anything. When we feel love, then we act in a loving way. And I, and I thought about this, and I think that I, I maybe have some help in it. I, I don't know that I have a complete answer. And that is that, uh, that we look at love differently than God does. That with God, love is more an action than an emotion. It does not mean that emotion does not get involved. The Bible talks about giving, that we are to give and lay up treasures in heaven because where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. And so God knows us so well. Our heart follows our wallet. Where we invest, that's where we have interest. And so I wonder if what God is saying here, if this command is not obedience first and emotion second. I remember several years ago, the Lord had laid the thought on my heart and I had it on a sticky note and the sticky note was on the rim of my computer screen. That's the way I do. I've got, a, you know, got the high tech there, you know, the computer, and I've got the whole thing sometimes covered with sticky notes, the old school, you know. But I remember having a sticky note on the rim, the outside uh, 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 casing of my computer screen that said this, I do not have to feel love towards someone to act in a loving way. I can act in a loving way without a particular emotion tagged onto it. In other words, I don't have to 
feel about someone in a loving way in order to act in a loving way toward them. I can act in a loving way. I can be kind. I can be, uh, act in a loving way towards someone. And by the way, is that not what God has done? He acted in a loving way toward those who deserve no love, who deserve no favor. He loved us, the Bible says, when we were altogether unlovable. And yet he loved us. And as I read this passage of scripture, I'm reminded that this is not the only time that we are uh, visited with this command. I wonder if, if you were asked, where do you suppose the first time that this commandment occurs? I wonder if you would know at least round numbers or round terms where it might be. But not only is it found, and it's found first in Deuteronomy, uh, and we're going to go there in just a minute. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 5 is the first time that I see this specific commandment laid out that way. And you can go ahead and go there, as a matter of fact, while we're, while we're talking, while I'm talking, you're listening. And we find it the first time, but not only do we find it the first time in Deuteronomy, we find it the most in the book of Deuteronomy as of anywhere else in the Bible. The book of Deuteronomy, for many Christians, is flyover country. We just can't wait to get out of Deuteronomy because it's laws and rituals and, and rites and things like that, and, and we don't see a lot there for us, but, but it is rich with this relationship between God and man. It's found uh, in some variation or form. It's found uh, in Deuteronomy 6.5, in Deuteronomy uh, 10, 12, in Deuteronomy 11, 13, in Deuteronomy 13, 3, in Deuteronomy 30 and verse 6. Uh, and so it's found most often in, it's found also in the book of Joshua. Be diligent to heed the commandment of the law which Moses gave, uh, the servant of God, Lord, charged you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cleave unto him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. It's found also in Matthew, where we read just a moment ago. It's found repeated in Mark chapter number 12 and Luke chapter number 10, the synoptic gospels. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. And then he goes on and talks about the second is like unto it. But his reference is all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter number six. This included with some other passage in Deuteronomy, I believe. I'm probably going to state this wrong and I'm going to get uh, emails from somebody who knows much more about this than I do. Uh, they, it is a common practice in Israel to put a scroll on the post of the door when you would enter into their house. If it is a Jewish home, they'll have, uh, typically they'll have a little box attached to the house. Uh, to the right door frame as you enter the house. It'll have part, uh, like uh, Deuteronomy uh, 6, verses 4 through 8 or 9 or 11, somewhere in there, and then another passage later on in Deuteronomy. It'll, it'll, it will be uh, placed in that. And really, uh, if it's a, uh, a strong uh, Jewish home, it is to be on every door, with almost every door within the house, on the right-hand side as you enter that doorway, it's there to be a reminder, uh, and we're going to talk about that they put it on the, uh, the doorposts of their house, and they still practice that today. When Mrs. Wagashus and I were in Israel a couple of years ago, we actually purchased one of these and, uh, and, and brought it home. We've got it somewhere. It's in our, our big pile of stuff somewhere. I don't know where it is. She doesn't mention it. She knows where it is. You know where it is? She knows right where it is. Amen. Uh, you know, it's not important, husband that you know where everything is in your house as long as your wife does, amen? And, <laughs> and usually if she does, she'll remind you that she knew. Uh, but once in a while, once in a great while, I'll know where something is and she doesn't. She knows, for instance, where her chocolate stash is and I don't. And uh, uh, one of these days I'm gonna play hooky from church when she's here and I'm gonna go through her stuff and I'm gonna find it. Uh, <laughs> but, 
But, uh, and so she knows right where it is, but it's, a, it's a, a little box, and the box can be any shape or size, really. Uh, but in that is placed a scroll, and that scroll is not sealed up, it's left open uh, so that at least twice every seven years they can take it out and make sure uh, that none of the lettering is smudged or or is, uh, uh, you know, has become faded or anything like that, and they, they check it. it, it these, are, these are typically, they, it has to be someone who is qualified. Not anybody can just write these. You can't just, you know, you're not supposed to just print these off. Uh, they probably do for the tourists, I don't know, but, uh, but uh, they're supposed to be written uh, by someone who is trained uh, to, to write this uh, and to make it an official uh, scroll, an official, uh, what they call the, the mezuzah, and, uh, and it, so it it's refers to that parchment on which these verses are inscribed, uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, as far as I can uh, research and understand, I do not read Hebrew, and then also chapter 11, verses 13 through 21 are written on that scroll, and, uh, and it's there to remind them, and, and the, the, they have 30 days from the time that they move into a place to get that Put, uh, put on there and uh, to make, to declare that this is a Jewish home. And it fits with what we're talking about, about uh, how we're going to obey the command of Christ to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Let's pray quickly. Father, I ask that you would impress this upon us and or that we might uh, uh, desire tonight that we might Know how to love you. God, this is much more than I have the ability to really get into. And God, to try to command someone to do something that is merely emotion would be folly. But you command it yet and you command our obedience. And certainly you are worthy of our emotional love as well. God, we love maybe out of duty and obedience. And then the more we understand as a child that grows up, begins to understand the sacrifice that parents have made, they begin to love them more uh, more deeply. We begin by, if you love me, keep my commandments, and then we grow to appreciate and love because of the sacrifice for us. And God, I pray that you would help us tonight to determine to be obedient to the command, the the greatest commandment, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 then, and uh, verse number, beginning in verse number 3, hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, that that ye may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. This is, we're going to read some more in just a moment, but if you back up to verse number one, again, the chapter and verse divisions are added for our convenience. They're not, they weren't uh, divinely inspired or anything, but they are convenient tools for us to be able to locate where we are. But the Bible begins chapter 6 by saying, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you may, might do them in the land whither you go to possess it. Now when he says these are the commandments, he's referring not to what he's about to say as much as to what he's already said. Because if you go back into chapter 5, you'll find what we commonly know from Exodus chapter number 20 and call them the Ten Commandments right at the end of Deuteronomy chapter number 5. And so as as you get to chapter number 6, you find that these are the commandments that he encouraged them to obey when they got into the land. And when he gets to chapter uh, 6 and verse 4, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou uh, walkest by the way. And when thou liest down and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for uh, for a sign upon thine hand. 
and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Egypt is a type of uh, the world. It uh, pictures for the Christian life when we were lost before we were saved. And uh, uh, coming out of Egypt is a type because of the Passover lamb. Uh, at that, uh, that the Passover lamb, was, the Passover was established right before they came out. A lamb was slain. Uh, the blood was placed on the doorpost. And God brought them out. A type and a picture of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And then the wilderness wandering, a type of the, um, the, the defeated Christian life or the immature Christian life. And then, uh, then after 40 years, entrance into the land that, of promise, picture of the victorious Christian life. Not heaven, but the victorious Christian life. And with that picture in mind, he says, once you get into the land, beware because you're going to, you're going to eat from crops you didn't plant. You're going to live in cities you didn't build. Uh, you're going to enjoy all these things that you had nothing to do with, but God has provided them for you. And when you get comfortable, when you get uh, uh, filled, beware lest you forget the Lord your God that brought you out of Egypt. Now for us, that means for us, be careful when you get in, uh, involved in the Christian life and you get comfortable Beware lest you forget the God that saved you. You forget the God that saved you. And how do we keep it fresh? How do we love God? I don't have a full or complete answer at all. All I can do is go back to the scripture and tell you what I have found. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5, the law of first mention is the first place I find the commandment, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. It's not the first place where told to put God first because in the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter number 20, thou shalt have no other gods before me. There, all of the ingredients of loving God first or putting God first are found in those commandments. But the specific or the explicit command is found here. And then he goes on and says some things, five things that it looks like will be helpful for us to obediently love God and eventually, emotionally love God as well. Children, children um, are taught to obey. The Lord said to his disciples, if you love me, keep my commandments. Obedience is not separated from love. It is a part of love. We're trying to figure out, you know, how God could command us to love him when love is an emotion. How can you command an emotion? It's like, you know, a husband trying to command his wife to love him, uh, that, uh, that you can't command an emotion. Well, we're missing the point, I think, because love is not necessarily first an emotion. That's kind of our 21st century experience, but that's not really Bible revelation. Love in the Bible is first and foremost an, an obedience to the Lord. And so he gives us some ways here that we can Put this into practice. And so let's just look down through the scriptures and let me show you what I have found. When he says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Notice in verse number six, he says, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. The first way I think that we can do this is through meditation. Through meditation. There ought to be a, a constant practice of meditating on the Word of God in the life of the Christian. I, I remember growing up in church, and, and uh, I can't even tell you how many times I heard pastors or evangelists get up and try to describe meditation. And the most common uh, uh, illustration of that was a cow chewing its cud. 
Uh, I don't know how that came about, or, uh, but they, they always talk about a cow chewing his cud and, you know, that it would, you know, it's got, uh, you know, a bunch of stomachs. I don't know how many. I, I'm not a cow person, but um, four stomachs. All right, four stomachs. I'll take Brother Caleb's word for it, which is dangerous, but I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I don't know, he'll chew, and then he'll, he'll digest and bring it back up and chew and down and up, and, and he just kind of go over it and over it and over it, meditating on it, thinking about it, and the child of God ought to be meditating all the time on something from God's word, some principle, some truth, some statement, some verse, uh, something about God, meditating on it, thinking about it, because it's in that time of meditation that the Spirit of God will reveal things to you and speak to your heart, and it's how it becomes a part of you. We talk all the time about the key to learning is repetition. Repetition is the key to learning. Repetition is key to learning. Repetition is key to learning. Repetition is key to learning. Okay, the pew of power. What's key to learning? Repetition, all right. She was the only one. <laughs> the other two went. Uh, and so repetition is key to learning. And that's, we, we learn things by repetition. The things we repeat when you want to memorize something, there's no big secret to how to do it. Repeat it. Just go over it, go over it, go over it, go over it. Just like you memorize your phone number. Nobody memorizes phone numbers ever, anymore. Everything's on speed dial. Amen? I couldn't tell you anybody's, I couldn't tell you if my wife's wasn't just one number off from mine, I couldn't tell you her phone number. I don't know, I don't know your phone numbers. I just know where you are in my list and hit speed dial. Uh, and uh, so no, but, but the way we would memorize phone numbers is you just repeat it. The way you memorize your social security number is you fill out job applications, amen? And, uh, and <laughs> when you write it about 300 times, then all of a sudden, now you know your, your social security number. It's amazing to me. That's how I learned my, is that how you learned yours, amen? Uh, and so when any, anybody asks uh, for your social security number, I always have to start to begin. They say, give me the last four. Yeah. I got I to gotta go through the first <laughs> ones to, to get to the last four because I didn't learn it from the last four. I learned it from the beginning, amen? And so I got to start at the beginning and work my way through. We learn by repetition. And so when we meditate on God's word, we are, we are th you say, well, I don't know what to meditate on. Well, you can start with this command, that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy, uh, uh, with all thy might, uh, there's three, three points, uh, all you need is a poem and you've got a sermon. And uh, there's plenty to meditate on there to, to think on these things, amen? To meditate on God's word, to keep them in thine heart. Now we can talk a lot about scripture memorization, but it's not just memorizing it. Memorizing scripture is so that we will have it ready. You know, you're driving down the road and there's some, you know, a couple of words of a scripture, and you, you don't have your Bible there. You don't have your concordance there. Uh, uh, you know, you shouldn't Google it uh, while you're driving. You should look it up on your Bible app while you're driving. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's today we've got, you know, uh, you know little, tran uh, excuse me, uh, digital copies of the Bible with us all the time. And it makes it very convenient. But it's no substitute for hiding God's word in your heart. No substitute for, for thinking on it and meditating on it and becoming part of you so that you uh, can rest upon it, so that you can quote it, so that God can bring it up and you can use it in your own life and in the lives of other people as well. Brother, uh, the, Brother Troy in the devotion for a prayer meeting this morning, the phrase that he, that he, that he read that stuck out was to, to keep yourself unspotted from the world. Boy, just something like that to think about, to meditate. And I've been thinking about it all day, to keep yourself unspotted from the world. If we're, if we're wanting uh, to please God, we're going we're gonna to have to focus on that. By the way, you don't keep yourself unspotted from the world without attempting to do so, without setting your mind to do so. You'll get drawn into uh, temptation and drawn into uh, testings and, and drawn away from the Lord unless you intentionally set your mind and set your heart to keep yourself unspotted from the world. 
or how we need to meditate on God's word. And so the first way, I don't want to spend too much time on each of these, but the first way is meditation. And then in verse number seven, thou shalt teach them diligently, them is the commandments of God, thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Teach them diligently unto thy children. Not only meditation, but also communication. Communication. In communicating, we are, we are trying to transfer God's word from us to another person. When uh, I, I mentioned we were in Israel, so that's where my mind is. We were in Israel, we were at the, uh, the uh, Wailing Wall uh, where uh, they go and they pray. And just off to the side is, um, is a series of rooms that are just, there's no door you just kind of walk down. It looks like a long corridor, but it's really a, 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 um, a hallway that is, you know, uh, a bunch of rooms. And uh, there are people in there. They're reading. They're studying. And uh, the one time we were there, there was a, a group of uh, small school-age children. There was a man there, and he was teaching them uh, from, uh, from a, a book, I don't know, I don't know that it was the Old Testament, if it was the Torah, or if it was, um, uh, you know, uh, sometimes they study and, and recite uh, interpretations of the law. And so I'm not sure exactly what he was doing, but he would say something and they would repeat it. And he would say something and they would repeat it. He would say something and they would repeat it. And then they'd sing, sing a, a little bit, uh, and I'm sure that uh, what they sang was, uh, was like we sing psalms and, and memorizing things through song. And uh, you know what he was doing? He was teaching it to their, to their children. And uh, we, need to, we need to communicate God's word. When you, when you sit down and you begin to try to put what you believe into words, it refines, it refines your beliefs. It's one thing if I said, hey, do you know what the Bible is talking about, about propitiation? Or you say, oh, yeah, yeah, I got that. Okay, explain it to me. Well, um, it's kind of like, um, you know, it, you know it's, it's sort of like, it's kinda, you know, and boy, it come, becomes, when you have to actually put it into words, now you have to actually think about what you know or what you, and you find out sometimes what you don't know. Um, Brother Terry stopped by the office yesterday and and we were talking about, you know, writing the devotions. And he's like, just, just whip it out. Just whip it out. Okay, I, I can't. That is not the way I roll. But I, I have to think about the wording of it and think about how to say it in a concise way. And, and I fail many times and have to refine it again and go back and do it again. And, and it, takes me, uh, it takes me way too long probably. I probably, I probably spent as much time studying for one little devotion more than studying for a sermon to preach. Uh, because I'm putting it in written form and, and to, to study it out and to think about uh, how it's used in its context. And I spend just as much time studying and researching for a little devotional thought as I do for preaching a sermon. That's just the way I am. But, but uh, you know, when you go to communicate it to somebody else, you know, if I said this morning, you know, what's the greatest commandment? And you say, well, I know the greatest commandment. Jesus said the greatest commandment was love thy Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and all thy might. And I say, okay, explain that to me. Oh, well, uh, you know, love God. You know, first, most. You know, <laughs> and that's kind of the way we would try to put it into words. But then I said, okay, you're going to be preaching on it tonight or giving a devotion on it tonight. You'd scramble home and say, okay, how am I going to explain that? Even something as, as, as foundational to the Christian life as loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and to, and to think about how do you command an emotion. Uh, it, listen, it takes, it takes, if you're going to communicate it, you've got to make it part of you. You have to think it through as best you can. But we ought to be communicating it. And when we communicate it, we learn it even better. And then number three, and still in verse number seven, he says, And thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. 
this is different. You say, well, that sounds like communication. Well, this is more conversation. This is more conversation. Communication means we are trying to like teach a lesson in it or communicate a truth to someone. We're instructing them. This is just meaning in our normal day-to-day life, in our, in our walk with, uh, with our family and our, our neighbors and our coworkers to fit in. You know, listen, you, you might not be able to preach at work. You work in a secular, now I work here so I can preach here, but, <laughs> but, but uh, you might not be able to preach at your secular job. But you can squeeze in Bible verses and Bible truths and, and there's, there's always openings uh, if you look for them to communicate the things of God. But you've got to have them in your heart to love God first. He says to do these things, to meditate on them, to communicate them. And then they ought to be part of our conversation when we rise up and when we lie down. I mean, from morning to evening, when you walk by the way and when you sit in your house, not just privately, also publicly. And boy, there's a lot in that, but I want to hurry on. Number, verse number eight. He says, Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. They shall be as frontless between thine eyes. Here is application. Application. This frontless between thine eyes and and uh, bind them for a sign upon thine hand. And, uh, and the, the, uh, the very Orthodox Jews, when you're in Israel, you'll see that. They'll have a small little box uh, that will have a small scroll in it. And it, it'll be a portion of Scripture like, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. It'll have that inscribed on it, and that scroll will be in that little box. And with a couple of leather straps, they'll actually bind it a little box on their forehead, a little box on their hand. That's what's on the doorpost. And put it on the doorpost of the house we're going to get to in just a moment. Well, what is that? That's keeping it in their, that's keeping it right between their eyes. It's keeping it uh, right uh, as they're walking, as they, as they go to do something. It's right there. The Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. I don't know, I wonder sometimes, I, I work with, and I've mentioned this before, it works best with me with triggers throughout the day, that when these things happen, then I read a verse or whatever it might be. And I wonder sometimes if that's not similar to what the Orthodox Jews will do. And again, I'm not you know, promoting Judaism by any stretch, we are New Testament Christians, but to keep the things of God in front of us daily, to talk of them when we walk by the way, to talk of them when we are, reside in our homes, to teach them to our children, and to keep them and bind them upon our foreheads and upon our hands, to keep them before us all the time, this is application. Now we're doing something about it. We're, we're keeping it right there where we're going to be aware of it and it's going to guide us. The whole idea of frontless between thine eyes is to guide you, to keep you from being distracted. And then lastly, he says in verse number nine, thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. And next to this, I wrote in my Bible, perpetuation. Perpetuation, that that. that Listen, when you put something on the do- doorpost of your house, it's, it's a permanent thing. You know, it's, it's there. And it perpetuates this for them, for, uh, for this commandment, for the Jews, it perpetuated that this is a home that honors God, that in this home we are going to put God first, that when you enter this home, you're entering a place where we're going to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all of our soul. And listen, uh, again, I'm not promoting Judaism because we are New Testament Christians, but we ought to be even more diligent and more uh, committed in our life because our sins are forgiven. We know the Messiah, Jesus Christ, as our Savior. He's the Lamb of God which took away our sins. And we need to keep them before us. We need to write them on the posts of our house, so to speak. We need to be perpetuating it from one generation to the next. That, listen, 
that, that uh, whoever comes behind us, there's a testimony on the doorpost of our life that we loved God and we put him first to perpetuate from one generation to the next. As the Jews put that mezuzah on the doorpost, we need to put it on the doorpost of our life to love God first. You say, what, what would we write? What, do we, what would we write if we were to bind something to our forehead and on our hand? What would we write on the doorpost of our house? Love, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. We start off by obedience. But where we obey, we also come to love and appreciate what God has done for us. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And if there's love there, uh, by the way, uh, he commands us to love. Love is at least partially obedience. It's at least partially obedience. Now, let me say it this way. You, cannot claim, you can claim it, but you cannot prove your love for God without obeying him. Without obeying him. And I don't know any better how to direct us as Christians from where we are in our life rather than to say, make it a priority. If this is going to, if we're going to say this is, Jesus said, this is the greatest commandment. If we're going to heed the words of Christ that this is the greatest commandment, it's not just the Old Testament commandment because Jesus answers that in the New Testament to love God first. To put him first, to love with all our heart, our soul, and our strength, everything about us, to serve the Lord with all of our being. Then it's a matter of obedience for us to, to meditate on it, communicate it to others in conversation, in application, and, and in perpetuation to pass it on. It's a tremendous thing. We've got... We've got uh, Christians here that are in their youth. We've got Christians here that are advancing in years. You know what's really good for the young people is to see people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond still walking with God, still putting God first. I remember preaching many years ago as a young preacher at a fellowship meeting and at that fellowship meeting were many pastors that had been my instructors in college. And I remember making a statement something like this to those preachers who are our instructors. I said, you know, you taught us, you taught us what is right. You taught us to follow the God's leadership. And we are trying to do that, but we are young. And we still need you to break down the tall grass in front of us. It's one thing to send children out through tall grass and say, well, just go that way and don't stop till you get to the other side. They can become disoriented because they can't see as far. They can become distracted by what's there. They can be discouraged by how hard it is to, to walk through uh, the obstacle. But if they've got someone who's been saved longer and walked with God longer, who knows what it is to spend the sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, who knows what it is to have God come and, and bring sweet joy and peace, even when all things around them are sorrow and dark. That breaks down the tall grass in front of the young ones and gives them direction. It's a path to follow. Oh, we need to leave those generations behind us a clear path of loving God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our might or strength. And if we're not, none of us are doing that as far as we could. I just say this, there's room for advancement with each one of us. Amen? Would you agree with that? Say amen. amen. And then let us move forward in obedience to this command and let you say well you really didn't give us the formula no I I don't know how to put it into words it is it is obedience that leads to a heart that lead that directs our heart but all I can say is that I believe that in the obeying you will find 
you will find that love for God. Father, I pray that you would help us to do, uh, that you might do what we cannot do in trying to define loving you supremely. We know that it means putting you first. We know that our love for you must be supreme over all other loves. We know that, that uh, uh, we can promote this love in our life through meditation and, and communication, conversation, uh, application and perpetuation. We know that we can do that, but Lord, it still doesn't really answer the whole question of what happens in our heart as we follow you. God, it's such a personal thing. Each individual's relationship with you is a personal walk with, with you. But I think I can say authoritatively that we, we probably fall short somewhere of loving you with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our might. God, I pray that we would take steps forward because we meditated, that's really what we've done here tonight, is just we've meditated on the principle. We've tried to communicate in some way the principle, the commandment of loving you first. God, I pray that those commandments upon which this command rests, to have no other God before you, to not take your name in vain. Lord, I pray that these things would resonate in our hearts and become part of our daily meditation. Lord, that throughout the day there might be checkpoints in our life to say, are we loving you first? We ask it in Jesus' precious name with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.